Okay, Joel Gertner is on the line. So uh, let's get let's get Joel up. Uh, Joel, how are you doing today? Good, Dave. How are you? I'm doing really good. So um, one question that I've always been meaning to ask you, okay, and uh-huh. that is, what do your parents and your family think about uh, <laughs> leaving Cornell for ECW? They hate it. They yeah. absolutely they can't. I don't think they can understand it, and and they hate it. You know, um, but I, I guess they just don't get it. You know, because at Cornell, which, I mean, I went there because, I mean, I applied to all eight Ivy League schools, right, and eight other ones, too, and most of the essays were about wrestling, so, of course, I wasn't anywhere that was about wrestling, I wasn't getting in. Now, mm-hmm. Cornell, their application didn't allow me to write my essay about wrestling, I had to write it about something else. I got in, it was the only eight of the Ivies that that was the case for, so when I see that I get in there, I say, okay, I got in there, I got into NYU, Boston University, and they all had good TV radio kind of programs. Cornell didn't. Cornell was like, a lot of people took communications there where it was just something to take, something to fill their schedule. They really didn't want to even be involved. And the communications curriculum at Cornell was really, it was theoretical. It wasn't applied. It wasn't like get into the TV studio, learn how to edit, learn how to produce, learn how to be on air. And, uh, of course, I didn't care. I just went to Cornell because I got in, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to be doing. And it was, the, I guess, most prestigious school out of the ones that I got into. And sure enough, no TV radio curricul- curriculum there. I would have been better at Ithaca College, which was three miles away. They had, like, the number three or number two TV and radio curriculum in the country. But anyway, as far as Cornell goes, I mean, uh, you know, I don't think my parents understand at all. But I'm better off because had I stayed at Cornell, finished through, um, and, and finished up, I was taking TV radio at Ithaca College, and I finished doing that, you know, if I were working at a radio station in, oh, man, uh, Kansas, let's say Wichita, Kansas, for example, you know, I'd be making so much less than I am now, I wouldn't have the same kind of exposure, and I wouldn't enjoy my job as much. So for me, you know, it's a dream come true, but for them... They, de- they never let you get away with saying what you're allowed to say either. No, of course not, you know. <laughs> How'd they ban you from writing about wrestling? What's that? What was in the uh, deal that wouldn't let you write about wrestling? How is it stated? Oh, Cornell's essay was just uh, pick somebody in your life that, uh, you know what, I did 16 of them in like a 10-day period, so I can't remember which was theirs. But Cornell's was something like pick somebody in your life that's uh, that's made a difference and talk about why. Or and they can't be a wrestler. Like, you know, what, what is the meaning of the word respect? And I mean, they're, they're all so... Bret Hart, no. <laughs> so there's one, I think it's UPenn, and uh, at the time their essay was... Okay, uh, we're holding your autobiography in our hands. Give us page 146. And I'm thinking, well, if you're holding it in in your hands, why do I need to tell you it's on page 146? I didn't write that, but (laughs) they want to read the whole thing. Too long. So, uh, yeah, but, you know, Cornell was an experience, just just like anything else. And while I was there, uh, I was sports director of a radio station. The stuff that I did off campus was, was really what helped me the most as far as where I am now, because in the classroom at Cornell, I was just, you know, like astrology or, you know, geology. None of that meant anything to me. Um, what The things that I, I took psychology, and, and that wound up actually, you know, working to my advantage, because it's just, it was a good thing to take. Um, communications, but like I say, I did most of that at Ithaca College, but I did like, for seven or eight of Cornell's teams, and, and they are Ivy League, so, you know, they're terrible, but they are Division I. Uh, I did their public address uh, for their wrestling team, which is, like, you know, ranked top 20 some years. Some years it isn't. Um, and I was a sports director at the radio station in town, which wasn't actually linked to the college. It was actually an NBC News radio affiliate, and uh, and that really gave me a lot of exposure and experience and, and just hands-on know-how and uh, and some connections and contacts, too, because uh, that same station, Keith Olbermann was the sports director like 15 years earlier. So, you know, oh. that was cool. And, Brian, uh, you got you to gotta head out, right? Yeah, I got to go. Okay, thanks a bunch, Brian. We'll be talking to you tomorrow. Joel, I know you've been basically a wrestling fan for life, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, um, what, like, what were your, what I guess would be your earliest wrestling memories? Oh, man. Um, when I was, I 
think I started watching around when I was eight, and that would be like uh, late '83, mid '83, somewhere around there. And uh, around the time that I want to say Atlas and Johnson were WWF tag champs, we didn't get much but WWF up here at that time. I'm from Brooklyn, New York originally, and you know, big Titan stronghold, and you know, the Garden was the big thing. Uh, so Atlas and Johnson were the tag champs. And I think Backland was still um, at the end of his reign as WWF champion, and I always liked the heels. You know, I just I never could get into to Backland really. He, you know, he was great, but I never could get into his gimmick. He wasn't a favorite of mine. Same thing with Hogan. That's nothing against Hogan. That's just that I didn't like baby faces ever. Uh, Jake Roberts was my favorite wrestler. I thought he was tremendous. I thought he was just great because I liked the promos. That's that's really what sucked me in, you know. I was really interested in, in the interviews and, and that kind of stuff. And, and the wrestling just, you know, it was good too. But I, I really liked the promos. Now, what was your first connection with ECW and how did it wind up where it is right now? Um. I started working, and when I say working, I mean, I guess to work you have to get paid, right? So I don't know if what I did for the first couple of years was working, but uh, I started, I went to a gym called the Lower East Side Wrestling Gym when I was 16, and uh, and I met people there just by, you know, volunteering a referee, ring announce, manage, and I used the atmosphere there to train myself how to do all those things, and I met people there like um, like Jason, the sexiest man on earth, and... Canyon, uh, Little Guido, met a bunch of people and, and just worked the independent circuit for a while. And, you know, when you're 16, 17, 18 trying to get bookings, you work for free. That's that's just how it is. Finally, um, I'm like 20 years old, and uh, I just go up to Paul. I, I see him, and I tap him on the shoulder, and I say, you know, listen, my name is Joel Gertner. Uh, I go to Cornell University. Uh, you guys are doing a show in Middletown, New York. I said, I know that all of your timekeepers and ring announcers are from the Philadelphia area. I'm only a couple hours from Middletown, and I would love to get a tryout. Is that possible? And he just looked at me, and he said, you want it? And I said, yeah. And he said, you got it. Be there by 6. And, and, and that was the beginning, you know. So I don't – I'm leery of telling that story because I don't want – I tell that story to people sometimes – when they ask me how I got started with Paul, and they say, oh, maybe I should go tap him on the shoulder and ask him for a job, too. You know, and these are, you know, people who aren't in the business yet or people who have been in for two months, you know. So I, I kind of tell them, you know, I, it's not that I recommend doing it that way. But after I had been around the business for about four years, um, that's just what I did. I just gave him a verbal resume and, you know, told him I was willing to help out. And that was it. He told me, and this would have been, I don't know if it's right around this time you're talking about or very shortly thereafter, um, and it was way before you were ever, you know, any kind of a prominent television personality. Or, and, in fact, it was right when, probably right about the time he was about to start you as one. Uh -huh. He just goes, he reminds me of me at the same age. Yeah. So I think that something must have connected. And, you know, because Paul obviously was a fan from childhood and, you know, the, the same thing. You know what I mean? I'm sure he worked, he did plenty of things for free for a long time before. He ended up running his own company. So Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of parallels that can be drawn between Paul and myself, and, and he's told me that on occasion that he sees a lot of himself in me, and, uh, you know, that's great. I mean, who better to, to pattern myself after? I mean, Paul's somebody that I admired and, and enjoyed watching, you know, when he was in WCW, and I was, you know, just trying to get bookings and get into the business. So, I mean, I, I find that very flattering. Did he work with you on, on your delivery, or was that something that you just came up with through, you know, like, um, just naturally? Um, yeah, you know, it, it's always, everything's a work in progress. I mean, even still, like, uh, you know, Paul, Paul worked with me all along, and, and even now, um, now that I'm trying to make the transition to being a commentator, because it's, it's so much different than being a manager, and it changes your character, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of it's hard to explain if you if you haven't done either or. But, yeah, Paul worked with me in the beginning. A lot of it was uh, was natural, my own instinct, uh, what I thought a heel should be, what I thought somebody who looked and sounded like me should be as a heel to get the right kind of heat. 
Um, and, and that went through various stages. I mean, at first, I was a true heel. I had heat with the people because they hated me. And, and it was a kind of hate where here I was, you know, this kid, this, you know, white bread looking kid who, who looks like, you know, if he stepped outside the ECW arena after the show, he'd get mugged. And uh, he's coming from New York and he's taking Bob Ortiz was the long time, you know, Philadelphia ring announcer. And, and I was, I guess, taking his spot is the way it was looked at. And people hated me just because they hated me. And then that became, you know, I started getting a different kind of heat where, you know, people, they liked to hate me. It's gone through so many stages now as I've gone from, you know, a, a fill-in ring announcer to a regular ring announcer, foreign language ring announcer, and all the different things that I've done. But, yeah, Paul has definitely been there every step of the way as a great influence, and uh, he's definitely helped me. But, yeah, a lot of it is natural. Has there ever been a bump or a chair shot or something like that where it was like you were going like, God, I hope I never take another one like that one again? Uh, bumps are, you know, interesting for me because I I tried to train as a wrestler um, at the Lower East Side Wrestling Gym, and I just, after the first day, I just said, you know, this isn't for me. Not necessarily because I thought if I didn't apply myself, if, if, even if I applied myself, I'd fail. Not because of that, but more because I didn't enjoy it as much. And I knew that that meant I wouldn't be as successful because I tend to have success at things that I enjoy doing. That's just what motivates me. So, you know, I, I just I realized that even though I had paid the money and, and set my sights, the day earlier, the week earlier, on, you know, really learning how to wrestle that time out and taking it from there, I just realized that I enjoyed doing what I was doing before I paid the money to train to wrestle, just being there, managing, refereeing, ring announcing, learning. Um, you know, that, that that's just what came natural. Uh, let's, let's head to some phone calls. We've got a full bank of calls. We're going to start with Brent in Seattle. You're first up with Joel Gertner. Yes, uh... Hi, Dave. Hey, Joel. Yep. Uh, I don't know whether you're free to comment on this, but uh, uh, what type of effect do you think it would have on ECW to uh, to move to USA Network? Uh, you know, uh, what what effect on a you know would a live television show have? And personally, what about uh, your style? And how do you think that would go over uh, on a live television show and potentially on USA? Uh, okay, I'm trying to. I couldn't hear that all that great. But that was about if ECW were to get on the USA Network because of all of the things that are going on right now. Right, and maybe theoretically, if you were doing live TV every week. Um, live TV is something that I think I, I'm almost ready to handle as it is, if not ready to handle. Um, I tend to overanalyze things a lot and uh, and say a lot of things that, that make sense, um, but maybe they're not the best way of saying them, and they get produced out, and, and it just gets replaced. And the way the show is right now, our TNN show, I, I, think it's, I think it's great. I think it's really smooth. As for live TV, I don't know. I mean, is the company ready? I think so. Certainly. I mean, the, the pay-per-views have gotten so much better uh, and are still improving as far as production, sound, lighting, things like that. But as far as the scope of the business and, and, and if we were on USA, I think it's too early to speculate. You know, um, USA has had the WWF for many years and in various incarnations, what they have going now is working out great for them. But, you know, when, when they had primetime wrestling, at times it wasn't working out. And, and even before the WWF, I think they had, what, Joe Blanchard's promotion out of yeah, San Antonio? South, Southwest Championship Wrestling right. was the first so, one, yeah. So, so they've, I mean, they've had wrestling, WWF and otherwise, for about 20 years. Uh, if we were to go on and be a new promotion for them, it, it all depends on how much money and, and what kind of strategy they would utilize towards promoting us and marketing us, advertising. Um, it, it just all depends. But, I mean, I, that's something that, you know, I shouldn't even speculate on because that, if, uh, you know, I mean, you it, know, it, it's a hypothetical, but it would certainly be interesting. Um, you know, what, what, what about... Uh, 
your style. You, a lot of people would say it's fairly vulgar, and, and uh, you know, with, with a larger exposure, do you think you would have to tone any of that down, and and uh, do you think you could be as over without it? I would, I would say that I'm probably no more vulgar than uh, than May Young being impregnated by Mark Henry. Well, and, and, and then giving that. birth to a Caucasian hand. I don't think I'm more vulgar than that, or or, or a lot of things that are current. I don't I don't find the WWF very offensive, but I'm very hard to offend. And and I don't find the things that I do offensive. People watch wrestling for for whatever reasons they watch wrestling, whether they'll admit those reasons to themselves or not. And and I think if you don't like it, change the channel. No, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that I don't like it. I'm just. I'm, I'm saying that you know that there there is a segment of the of the population that they might not be happy, and the top executives, you know, that they don't want they don't want to get bad, bad publicity from Bozo or Bozo or whatever. Right. Anyway. Uh, um, th- yeah. Thank I, you. I uh, thank you very much. And uh, y'all continue to watch uh, watch ECW and uh, let's go Zags. Bye. Okay. Okay, Brent. You know, it is, it is one thing. You know, like your 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 kind of like opening thing that you're that's kind of become your trademark. Um, it, 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 on the show you're on, it works because everyone expects it. If just let's say theoretically in September you show up, the first time you do it in front of a, a different audience, uh, there's gonna be some. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's gonna be some reaction from people at the beginning. Once it becomes established, I don't think there will be a lot. But at the beginning, there, there there may be some. One thing, you know, um, a couple there there have been instances where they've edited that thing out on TNN. Um, and even have they ever even made you like redo that? You know, you're open. No, I mean, you know, the opens are done, and if they're done in the ring and they edit them out, then obviously that can't be redone because you know we can't go find a ring somewhere and three thousand people and start it over. And if they're done in the studio, the bottom line is, I mean, I, I don't feel that it's necessary for me to change my content at all. Um, if they want to edit me, so be it. Um, they edited out doggy style last week, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. I've I've said things that are on that level before. You know, talking about uh, Dawn Marie and and her moist pouty lips and their vertical smile. Yeah, and I, 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 I think it's just that the people at TNN they don't get the vertical smile remark, <laughs> but, but but they can understand doggy style. So I, I think it's their IQ that comes into play, and not necessarily my content. But uh, you know, I mean, I mean, who knows? I don't. I think I get right now, give or take five or ten percent, depending on the mood of whoever's finger is censoring this stuff. I think I'm getting just about as much rope, as much of a leash as Val Venus gets on WWF product doing his nicknames and his sexual innuendo. So, I mean, I honestly don't think that anything I do or anything we do on another network would uh, would really, you know, phase people because the WWF has definitely done everything they could do to push the envelope as well. Plus, plus or minus, when, when, when you guys started pushing the envelope, um, you were going into a stratosphere that nobody else would touch. Then all of a sudden, when WF made their big switch... Uh, they pushed as far as you guys did. It had two th- advantages for it had two it had an advantage and disadvantage for your company. The advantage is you could get away with a lot more because once WWF anything WWF did first or or sort of did you could probably go without shocking people. But the other one is is that they were doing that same thing on a national basis, so your uniqueness in doing that wasn't as much. Yeah, like you say, Dave, pros and cons. I mean, WWF doing some of the things that we did first, uh, but them doing it on on more of a national basis with more exposure, certainly, like you said, and and it's just obvious, works for and against us, depending on in what aspect you're talking about. I mean, WWF pushing the envelope and doing things on pay-per-view, you know, before we got on pay-per-view, we were told, oh, well, you're too extreme for pay-per-view. The stuff you do, you can't do that. Then when the WWF does it, it's like, okay, we can't do it, but they can do it. Obviously, we're being discriminated against, you know? So once the envelope is pushed, it, it, like you say, it raises the bar and it sets a new standard. And then the things that we were doing all of a sudden are acceptable for pay-per-view. And 
you know, quite frankly, from some of the stuff that's on pay-per-view, I don't see why a lot of it wasn't in the first place. But now that it was, it was. But then, like you said, the disadvantage, and, and that's that, you know, a lot of the things that people, let's say tomorrow is the first time somebody turns on TNN and watches us. They could see us do anything that we do, but because they've already watched the WWF for one year, three years, ten years, they're going to say, oh, well, they're going to make natural comparisons, and they're going to say, look, uh, what they're doing is just like what the WWF's doing. It's not really the case, but it's, you know, it's just something that happens. Are you familiar with the stuff that's, that was in the New York Star-Ledger over the last week? There was a couple of articles in the editorial, by any chance? No. Okay, they... Um... They, I think it was in uh, what day? Tuesday's paper. Well, they, they, it actually started. There was a, a promotion, uh, Jersey All Pro, where a reporter went and they ended up doing a front page story on the show. And it was the large, the basis of the story was largely that there were young kids at this show that was doing, you know, cheese graters and the whole bit. Right. Okay. And then so they put it on the front page of the paper. Then two days later, you know, and wrestling was deregulated in New Jersey a couple of years back, so they could do the SummerSlam. So like the, for the '97 SummerSlam show. Right. So then the governors had a spokesperson going like, oh, my God, when we deregulated wrestling, um, you know, this isn't what we expected to happen. You know what I mean? We just expected to have, you know, the fun WWF wrestling. So then the newspaper and them, they're, 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 the, 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 the governor was talking about, or, or governor, governor spokesperson was talking about legislation to do something as it involves what they called extreme wrestling. And then the newspaper had a thing about that they should work on banning um, or, you know, banning um, extreme wrestling or ultimate fighting, which, of course, is a totally different genre anyway. Um, but, of course, we don't mean to go after the popular wrestling, you know, that's on cable TV. And I was just thinking, like, um, I don't know what they think that they mean, but the extreme wrestling invariably comes right back to your company um, because that's the name, and then not WWF. And yet, you know, if you look at, Basically, if, if if there's things that people are going to find offensive, it's it's either in both companies or if you don't find offensive, it's not offensive in both companies, but it's largely, you know, largely the same thing. Right. I mean, you know, yeah, like I said, I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I don't think if we were to show up on Monday on, uh, you know, the USA Network and uh, have our product that we had the previous Friday on TNN, I don't think it's really going to you know, set off that many alarms or get that many people saying, oh, my God, this is terrible. Let's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm calling the cable company. I don't want cable anymore. Or, oh, my God, I'm going to write my governor. And, I mean, you know, if, if you're familiar with the w, with what the WWF has out there right now on USA and, and then you see ECW in its current state, I, I you know, I don't know. I, I don't think there's that much of a difference insofar as, you know, being offensive. But, you know, like I say, that's, I don't know. It's tough for me to judge because I'm I'm not offended by the WWF product. It's pro wrestling. It's what pro wrestling has always been. You know, to, I mean, I, I've watched it since I was eight, and I've grown up watching it. And it, it's always been like this to an extent, and and it always will be. And and it's cyclical, and it's just that you know people seem to get sick of it, and then it got cartoonish and. People liked it until they got sick of how cartoonish it was becoming, and then it became more real life. People liked it again. It, it's just a cycle, and uh, it's going through the natural progression of, of the business. Uh, I, I can see that, I guess, because I've been following it for so long, uh, and a lot of people who haven't maybe don't understand, but, you know, that, that's just the way the business is. And uh, let's start hey, with let me, let me James. Ask Dave, Dave sure, do you think sure. I'd be able to uh, to make a wager with Ben Eckstein? Do you think he would take my bet on whether the uh, buy rate at the next w, WCW pay per view is going to be under a point one? Under I, a point I, one. I, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take wow. that bet. Wow. Well, I never would have thought that it was going to be under a point two ever. Yeah, it's uh, I, it's, it's, I, it's interesting. It's interesting. I've never seen a. Th- I've never seen a, a, a period in wrestling. I mean, I've seen, you know, we've all seen companies go up and down. But I don't know that I've ever seen a period where the pro, the public was so totally rejecting a product that they were still watching and paying attention to as far as buying. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, there were, there were like, things where people just didn't watch it and, you know, didn't do business. But I don't know that I ever saw one where... 
you know, like even though the TV ratings are down, you know, a lot of people are watching WCW on on Mondays and third and and uh, Wednesdays, and uh, some people on Saturdays. Um, you know, if we did a thing, someone actually asked me this question, um, and I didn't do the math for it, but if you figure your 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 show on TNN is probably doing uh, probably eight nine hundred thousand homes a week, and you're probably doing maybe one out of every eleven is buying the pay per view. WCW, if you look at um, the number of homes they're doing a week between the shows, you know you're talking about six million homes, and what would that be? You know, one out of one hundred and fifty is buying the pay per view instead of one out of eleven. Right. That says that says something about the audience, with the audience that's watching the product actually thinks about spending money on the product. Oh, I mean, watching it on TV when when you're getting it for free and, and when you would be watching TV anyway, it's just, you know, what do you choose to watch in comparison to, to other things is totally separate from what you're willing to get in your car, put gas in your car, drive your car, drive 45 minutes to go see, and, and then buy a T-shirt for. You know, it, it's totally different. When it's free... On television, it's moving wallpaper, you know. But when you're actually paying money to go to the show or you're paying money to get a show on pay-per-view, it, it shows a much higher level of support from a fan to a promotion. And, and what I find just unreal, and, and I'm, I'm so pleased, obviously, is the fact that, I mean, you know, in, we were in Chicago for, uh, for the Anarchy Rules pay-per-view last year, right? And, and yeah, I would yeah, venture, really, really hot show. I would yeah. venture to say that with five thousand plus people in the building, and let's say at five dollars a head merchandise, let's just say that. I think you did more. We probably in doing that, and I'm talking about our merch, not our gate. We probably with our merch beat the net. WCW on pay-per-view this last time around in the Chicago market. Probably. That's 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 insane, and it's telltale, and and it should be setting off signs over that they have a lot of great talent in WCW. They really do, and they have the money, they have the all the tools that it takes to have a great promotion. It's there, and and I'm not doubting that people there are working hard. They're just, they can do what it takes to make things better, but they're not. One of the things Paul has, obviously, is, is, is an ability to make wrestlers of medium size or less into players, which the other companies are either unwilling or unable to do. Uh, one of the, like, just as an example, it, it, we'll go with Jerry Lynn. Um, Jerry Lynn's a very talented wrestler, and when he was in WCW, as he was probably out of all the cruiserweights they had, he was in the bottom 10% as far as where they placed him, you know, with with all the different ones that they had. And even when it came to ability, he was no better than a lot of other ones there. Yet today, he's probably a bigger star than every single one of them, and it's because he's been in a place where there was no one. Uh, whispering down people's necks, saying, you know, he doesn't have this, and he doesn't have that, and he doesn't have this, and he doesn't have that, and therefore, he can't ever get out of the opening match. Yeah. And, you, you, know, you know what I mean? I mean, I mean in, in WCW, and, and it's in WWF as well, and I'm sure it happens in ECW because it's natural wrestling, but it doesn't happen as bad, is where you have these people going like, this is why this person can't get over. And, you know, I could do that about every guy, probably except for The Rock, in this business and give you a good reason why they shouldn't get over. But if they're over, all my reasons don't mean a thing, you know? Yeah. It, the size of a certain wrestler doesn't matter in ECW. And I, I think it's what Paul is able to do is in some of the other wrestling organizations, especially WWF and, you know, in, in, in different years, depending on who they're pushing at the top, just the way wrestling is, and, and we can be this way, I mean, this is just the nature of the beast, but the way wrestling is, or has been, what, what they think gets over and what they want to put effort into getting over is the unreal. This guy is unreal. This situation is unreal. You can't imagine it. You'll never see it in the street. It's unreal. What Paul's 
done with ECW that I've noticed totally makes me interested in the storylines, and, and, and I'm sure it's like this for, for all the fans, is that rather than it being unreal, Paul makes it real. And when it's real, it doesn't matter the size of the player. It doesn't matter who it is. When you have Steve Austin on TV, no longer trying to be glitzy and, and glamorous, but when you have him being real, when you have real-life situations, and I think that's, that's a lot of why the WWF has been so successful, is you know, in, in, instead of throwing guys out there that, that are like cartoons, it's like real life. People can relate to it. And I think Paul was an innovator as far as that goes, because wrestling was always this this fantasy world, and and, and now it's more real life. Um, let's 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 go to the calls. Let's go to James in Washington. What's going on? Hey, how's it going, guys? Real Pretty good. good. Uh, Joel, when you were um, before you got in the business, um, did you ever read any of the sheets? Yeah. Yep. Which, I used to, uh, on, on and off, I get the Observer, actually. Okay. Um, and and now, do do you ever get any of the, uh, at home, do you ever get any of the WCW or WWF pay-per-views? No. No, no I usually don't buy the pay-per-views. Yeah. Um, any idea when you guys are going to be coming out to uh, Seattle? Wow, as far as live events, um, I know it won't be within the next month or two. <laughs> Um, after that, I really couldn't tell you. Um, I don't know. It could be later this year. I, I would say just keep watching TNN and, and going to ecwwrestling.com. Right. And uh, and I'm sure you'll be able to find out. All right. Well, uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. You got it. All right. Okay, James. Um, it, you know, as as a fan, as a kid, and I know you watched. Um, you ended up, uh, as the 80s went on, watching a lot of the different circuits, if they were on TV. And Didn't you trade videos and stuff at some point, too? Yeah, I, I did that at one point. I, I was just trying to, to learn about the business and, and watch as much of it as possible, whether it be uh, you know overseas or, or just the various different territories. I just Anything I could do to, uh, to learn more about the business and, and watch more wrestling was uh, now, is there Is there anything, you know, like... In the in the 80s um, and even more in the 70s, every city sort of had its own little identity in wrestling. To me, you know, it's like Dallas had this, and Houston was this, and New York was this. Um, and then in the, it, it lessened in the 80s because it became a WWF WCW oriented thing. And then in the 90s, it almost feels like, you know, like the fans in every city are pretty darn similar. Um, like you don't have your you know, this thing will get over in, in New York because it's big guys. This thing will get over in California because it's work. Or this will get over in Florida because it's amateur wrestling based. It's like that's kind of broken down a lot. But as a performer, do you, like, have, like, cities where you go, you know, I can't wait to get to, you know, just like, just as an example, you're going to Kansas City for the first time this week or, or someplace like that? Or is it all just, well, the first time we're here, we'll see what the audience is like? Or do you have, a, like, a favorite city? Yeah, I'll tell you, the first time we go into a market, uh, you never know what to expect. And, and usually, actually, th this has changed recently. Recently, we've gone into, like, uh, Cincinnati and Milwaukee, and the fans of those cities are, are big enough, and we haven't been there yet. Those fans are so rabid for it. They, they just want it so voraciously that, that they're up for the whole show, out of their seats, and, and, and they love it. And, and that's turned into... A great TNN crowd for us is when we go into a new market. There have been times in the past where we would go into a new market and it wasn't as good. They didn't know some of the regular chants. They weren't as interactive. They hadn't seen the TV for as long, weren't into the character development, whatever. But in general, uh, Philadelphia is great. And, and I'm sure everybody was expecting to hear that, but they are. You know, they're... They're smart fans by nature. Uh, sometimes almost they, they want to be too smart to enjoy the product, I think. Um, but still, the product winds up being so good, so surprising, so creative and, and innovative and takes so many twists and turns that by the end of the night, on a given night, I've seen it happen at the arena where, you know, disbelief gets suspended even by the people that, that you wouldn't think would uh, would be interested in doing that. 
You know, uh, and Philadelphia always winds up being a great crowd. New York in, in Queens at the Elks Lodge was always great because the fans stood outside for hours. They knew that the place could only hold whatever it was between 1,000 and 1,500 fans. They knew that there were friends of theirs that were getting turned away and wouldn't be able to see the show. And, and whether we were up against, you know, the, the last episode of Seinfeld or whether we were up against a big baseball game, it didn't matter. People turned out, you know, two times as many people, three times as many people as the building could hold were interested in seeing the show, and the ones that were there gave you the response that, that sometimes you can't get in some of the other towns. But, uh, you know, like you say, it is national now, and, uh, and we're starting to get a great response everywhere we go. And uh, and that's great. One of the things since T- TNN started is there were a lot of markets that didn't get ECW, and so you didn't see in some of those markets the oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like the ECW influence, I guess, on the crowds. And now, like a, I went to an indie show a couple weeks ago as local promotion here, and I've been to their shows for years, and there really was never. Because ECW never had strong television in, in the in San Francisco area, you, you'd have your guys in the first couple of rows, and they were, you know, whether it be videos or satellite or whatever. I mean, they, you know, would wear ECW T-shirts and, and react like ECW fans, and and they were super hardcore fans. But general Bleacher fans and everything, I never saw what I would call an ECW influence in the audience. And at the last show, um, it was like tons of high school kids. And it was like kind of like a quasi WWF ECW response to everything, which was which actually in some ways wasn't good when they tried to wrestle, but when they gave the people what the people wanted to see, you know, which was like a table breaking. I mean, they were sitting there waiting for a table in blood, and when they finally got it, they popped like crazy. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because you know if you break it down city by city, I would venture to say that that your area of California certainly has more people viewing right now WCW than ECW. And there's no influence of WCW on the crowds? None. And, None. and you're right. I'm sure it's ten times more WCW availability and probably viewership. But right, but nobody's going to chant WCW when they see something. And, that's, and, no. and this is happening across the board. I mean, you, you can go to, you know, WWF Raw is War at... at Anywhere, uh, anywhere. Not only Meadowlands Arena and and or Continental Airlines Arena and and Madison Square Garden, which is markets that that ECW is strong in, but it's starting to happen in places that ECW isn't as penetrative of. And you'll see people just chant ECW when when they see something they like. And that's you know the I mean certainly when they see something that that is indicative of ECW or certainly when it's when it's one of our signature things, but it's to the point. I mean a lot of you know Taz and the Dudleys are doing great stuff right now in the WWF. They're there. They're doing their own thing, their new thing. But a lot of the time it just comes back to them getting ECW chants in lots of different towns. And and I think it's good for us, and I think it means that people truly want to see us. Because, like I said, whether it be at a WWF show with 20,000 people in the crowd or whether it be at an independent show with 200, people are chanting ECW when they're excited, when they're chanting. They're chanting ECW. They're not chanting WCW. And that's, I mean, it's certainly interesting because, like I say, WCW probably has – more viewers, but are those viewers, you know, person for person, pound for pound, are they as into the product? And, and of course, the answer is no. We've got a ton of phone calls and emails for Joel Gertner, so uh, I want to get through a couple of these things first. Um, There's actually a marketing idea. Will ECW ever market different color neck braces with bow ties on them? I think a lot of people in the crowd would wear them. That's a weird idea, but it's so weird it might actually work. Yeah, I actually heard the idea from somebody about a half a week ago, too. Um, I, I've seen people in the crowd dressed as me, and, and that's great. That's flattering. I'm, I'm glad they're, uh, they're that into my character. Um, ECW so far hasn't done anything with me insofar as marketing goes, and, uh, and I'd love for that to happen. So uh, I guess keep sending the emails. Uh, and, and maybe it'll happen, hopefully, in the near future. Um, I know uh, I was toying with the idea of putting out a, uh, a T-shirt and, you know, whether it'll be available, you know, through ECW or at my website, 
Um, I'm not sure, but toying around with one where the front of it is kind of, you know, the uh, the suit jacket with no... You ever seen those tuxedo T-shirts? Oh, yeah. You know, this would kind of be like uh, the suit jacket with no shirt on, you know, just looking like, you know, the front of my character, I guess. And then in the back would be a top ten list, and, and I was going to actually have the fans online vote for what they thought were their top ten uh, Gertnerisms, I guess a lot of people call them, and, you know, do an online tally, and, and whatever the people thought were the top ten, they'd get put on in that order, and, and then I'd try to sell the shirt, because a lot of people do ask if I have anything available as, as far as neck braces or T-shirts, and, and, and right now I don't, but, you know, hopefully in the near future. And, and hopefully an action figure as well. I mean, I'd... I think that would sell with, you know, different color neck braces and bow ties and, and stuff like that. Now, uh, real quick, tell everyone about your website. Uh, the website is, uh, right now, it's at David FJ, uh, F as in Franklin, J as in Joel, that's all one word, dot simplenet.com slash Gertner, which is a little bit tricky. But it's been there for a while, and uh, David FJ is a guy that's, he started doing my site like two years ago, two and a half years ago, and since then he's he's really become um, a great website developer of, of many different people's websites, and I know he works with the ECW website, and uh, he, he's just somebody that through loyalty I, I've stuck with all along, and uh, I believe uh, the people at OneWrestling.com are going to be helping us out, and uh, and it'll probably be moving to JoelGertner.com in the very near future. But for now it's at... Uh, DavidFJ.SimpleNet.com slash Gertner. Um, is uh, Kansas City or Wichita TV taping this week, or both? I or believe either. I believe Kansas City is. I, I think at one point neither one was. Uh, I know uh, I got my itinerary yesterday um, so to go out this weekend, so I guess uh, it is now a TV taping. I believe only tomorrow night in Kansas City is a TV taping, but uh, you know, with the cameras out there, to be honest, I don't know for sure. Uh, we could do TNN tomorrow and then tape some stuff for syndication the next day as well. I, uh, I haven't seen any of the diagrams of the building, and I've never been to either, so I, I, I don't know. But I believe tomorrow night is TNN. Okay. Um, hey, do you know anyone who has videos of Billy Graham, Bruno San Martino, and early Ric Flair? I don't know. Uh, I had them back when I was, you know, <laughs> 15. Okay. I would have been glad to. Um RF Video has a lot of stuff. Um, trying to think who I used to get videotapes from years ago. I, I mean, I'm going to be throwing out names of people that I don't even know if they're if they're still in the in the videotape game. I would say go to RF Video as, as a first choice. They seem John, to have uh, John McAdam. I don't know how to get John over McAdam. Them. I was just about to suggest. I mean, I, I certainly got a lot of tapes from John McAdam back in the day, and. Uh, I don't know. I, I would also suggest uh, Steve Friedlander. Steve Friedlander's got every. Yeah, Steve Friedlander and and uh, he's got everything. Yeah, his his catalog. I mean, if you're not ready to sit through it, though, don't don't even try because it's. I mean, it's double sided and he puts he miniaturizes four pages worth onto one eight by eight and a half by eleven page, and still the thing comes out to be like a thousand pages, two thousand pages. Yeah, he's got um, uh, literally thousands of tapes. Maybe at this point, tens of thousands. I mean, that's. I, I know, would think ten. I would think tens of thousands because oh, he has definitely, a, definitely yeah, by he, now. He, I'm he, sure. he has every. I mean, that, that that he probably has everything. Uh, yeah, so so between those three, uh, you should definitely be able to get lots of footage on those people. Uh, this is, did you ask him before Jerry Lynn's back? This question here. I'm sorry. How soon before Jerry Lynn is back? Uh, you know, I don't know for sure. I, I, I'm not sure. I think it's still going to be a few weeks. Um, I don't know exactly. I'm not sure if he'll be ready for, uh, for let's say, the next pay-per-view or not. I, I don't know. I haven't really heard. Yeah, I was. I remember I just was told a couple of weeks ago what it was. I'm, I'm guessing six weeks, but I could be. I'm not. I could be wrong about that. We'll try to check on that one. Uh, get one or two more really quick before. Uh, these are actually all about. These are. Let me go through some of these real quick, and then we'll get to the phone calls. Um, uh, do you think Jim Cornette would be a good booker for WCW? Um, I'm going to put this down for when Jim we have Cornette on the show, but my, my short answer is no. Um, uh, let's see. How can you forget the or artist DDT on Thunder? Oh, that thing was horrid. Did you see that last night, Joel? No, I, the artist I, didn't, did a I didn't see that. I was in the studio last night, so no. Uh, the artist did a DDT on Chris Candido. It was Chris Candido against Chavo Guerrero Jr. And, I, heard, uh, no, I heard they put Chavo over. 
Chavo went over uh, when the artist interfered and did this DDT, and you have never seen a more Miss DDT. Uh, I mean, the artist always, or 85% of the time, misses the move. Unless, with Sakosis, he hits it. With everyone else, he always misses it. And this was his worst miss to date. I felt so sorry for Candido having to sell this move. This this move, And then, plus, it's the second night in, he's already jobbing for Chavo Guerrero. I mean, I was stunned. More ways yeah, I, somebody told me it was actually, for better or worse, I mean, like I say, I hadn't seen Thunder. And somebody asked me today, they said, "Have you seen? did you see Thunder? I said, no. They said, uh, Chris Candido lost to Chavo Guerrero. And, and it was the first thing they mentioned. It was the only thing they mentioned. It was what was on their mind. And I, you know, I, I didn't hear what the surroundings were as far as why that happened, what the scenario was. But I don't know. I mean, that's interesting. Yeah, he also did an interview where he said that he stretched Luthes and, and uh, for, actually said Frank Gotch, not Carl Gotch. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, is Jim Cornette going to manage Al Snow and Steve Black? And the answer to that one is also no. Uh, let's go to John in Chicago. John, you're on the air with uh, Joel. Hey, Joel. Yeah, hey, uh, Dave, too. Um, first of all, I want to compliment on your work and everything uh, there. I, uh, I think you've made a pretty smooth transition. Thank, thank you um, very much. I appreciate it. And uh, like you were saying about the Dudleys, they last uh, last Monday at uh, Chicago, they were they were hot. I was at that I was at that show, and they almost got like the second biggest pop there. Um, well, there are two questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, the first question is, uh, do you think it's time? I don't know. This came up um, with Mark Madden uh, on their WCW uh, sh uh, internet show, where he has, uh, where he was saying that somehow Heyman doesn't want, has something, um, does not perceive the WWF as a competitor as much as as he does WCW, uh, because of the per you know, the personal history and the professional history uh, he had over there. Um, and I was wondering, do I mean, do you think it's time? I mean, uh, from what I, from my, from my vantage point, I kind of, kind of tend to agree with him a little bit. I mean, I, I think it's time that ECW does go after the WWF more than than they than they than they do. You know, just as far as verbally, you know, um, just going out, you know, saying the WWF. I mean, as far as copying us or you know. Stuff like that. I mean, it seems like more or less that you know, and and you are, you guys, in my opinion, are now the the number two promotion in the U.S. right now. So profitability wise, right? <laughs> or even just yeah, pay per view and just you pay -per -view know, wise, just, sure. just, just just as far as inside a wrestling fan's blood. I mean, mm -hmm. I would say if you go to like if you took a hundred wrestling fans off the street right now. Ask them to name the top two companies in the U.S., and they would say WWF and ECW. I would say the majority would. I would disagree with that, but I would say that of the people who watch all three companies, mm -hmm. I think they would say that. But I think that still the majority don't watch all three companies, and that's why I don't. I would. I personally would think. That, I mean, if you, if you were talking about in the South, then I would say yes. Well, no, 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 I, 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 think, I think I think I think anywhere there's there's so many people that still you know if you look at the ratings that they, they still don't watch ECW. Uh -huh. So when you're talking about the casual wrestling fan, I think you know even media or whatever when when media people like talk to me about wrestling, it's uh -huh. still WF WCW. Now when you're talking about hardcore wrestling fans and wrestling fans who watch all three and you go who are your, what are your two favorite i think that they will all say wwf and ecw and almost none will say wcw mm -hmm. but that's a, that's all I, I don't know joel you you could disagree if you want to no uh, educated wrestling fans that, that have been watching for a long time and and that know what to look for and and they're into wrestling now and they will be into wrestling five or ten years from now even if it goes through a down period yeah, you're going to find that their top two are the WWF and ECW, and, and, and for all the reasons that make sense. But as far as, you know, should we go after the WWF, uh, I mean, no, I, I don't know that we need to um, and, any more that, I mean, no, I, I don't think so. I, I think first we should try to convince everybody of, of what I think is a truth and, and what anybody else who, who thinks it's true, that, I mean, they'll certainly – you know, try to convince people, too, that, that ECW is number two. Hands down, number two, no worse than number two. Maybe you think it's number one in your heart, but 
at worst, it's number two. As long as there are people out there that think we're number three, and for the most part, the people that think we're number three are people who have never watched. That's, that's or, what I think. Or people, I mean, maybe they've started watching on TNM, mm -hmm. but their market never had syndication. Mm -hmm. So they've been watching WCW for 20 years. Right. They've been watching us for 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. Those people might still think we're number three, but we're not. And until we convince them that the only way we could be looked at as a number three compared to WCW being number two is market cap. Mm -hmm. In other words, they have so much more money behind them right. that even if we're making money, if they're losing tons of it, just because they have that much more to lose, they might still at the end of the year, at the end of the decade, have more money. But but that doesn't matter because as far as market cap goes, we're not going to be able to become number two for who knows how long. Uh -huh. But in every other aspect of the game, we are number two right now. We need to convince people of that. And then when we get more people convinced of that, you know, it, it becomes uh, we and the World Wrestling Federation at that point become you know, the top two across the board, and uh, and the big two, I guess, right. if you want to refer to it that way. Um, one last question I had for you. Um, now, you were talking about, you know, your the, the stuff, you know, as far as people will say, as far as the controversial remarks and everything. Uh -huh. um, I don't I don't want to make this, like, an uncomfortable question or anything like that, um, that but... Um, it just brought to mind when you had that, uh, well, I don't know, you know, just from an outsider looking in, when the, the JFK comment. Yeah, you know, that one wouldn't yeah. be on WWF. That, that is one thing that wouldn't be on WWF. No. Right, right. Certainly not. I'll, 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 I'll be honest with you, too. Mm -hmm. I, I could tell from the tone of the way you were asking the question, by the way, about two or three words in that that's, what, that that's where you were going to go. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it is touchy. And, and, Dave, I know you didn't, you didn't like it. No, not at all. Okay. Um, I can say this much. I don't think it's worse than a lot of things that have aired on Saturday Night Live mm -hmm. during their weekend update segment um, in, in Saturday Night Live's 25-year history. Uh, and at the time, we were on in syndication. We were... Uh, we were on at like 1 a.m. Yeah, I actually on, I on, on whatever stations we were on, mm -hmm. and Saturday Night Live. You know, they they've been on NBC doing Weekend Update at about you know 12:15, which is earlier than than some of the markets were in, and, and probably same time or later or whatever. I think but I, I mean, saw I think I saw it at three o'clock in the morning in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the point is, in comparison, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's. It's the worst stuff that has ever been aired on television. I understand how people could find it offensive. Uh, I tried to to make light of it and, and be humorous, and uh, and and maybe you know, maybe I should be taken to task, or or maybe not. Maybe some things just can't be made light of. Like I say, I'm. It's very hard to offend me because I. I kind of I can see comedy in in maybe some things that some people can't see comedy in, <laughs> but uh, you know I mean. Man, Dennis Leary is out there with CDs, you know, and, and George Carlin and a lot of comedians, and, and there's a lot of comedy on, on television, whether it be network or whether it be cable or whether it be pay-per-view. There's a lot of stuff that's been on radio airwaves and, and, and television airwaves, uh, and, and I don't think the Kennedy stuff was near the worst of it. Well, to me, know? the one the one thing on that is is that um, I remember when the day the Monday after Owen Hart died, um, when Craig Kilborn made the jokes and some of the stations were playing free falling and wrestling fans were furious about it and and I was um, because I felt you know it was like too soon afterwards and and to me it was like the exact same thing. Right. Yeah. Well, to we, me that was the only thing that I've you know I've had some pro problems with with your work. I mean, otherwise, I mean, I really think you've done a, a really great job uh, on. ECW on TNN, and I, I hope uh, to hear, uh, I hope if you get more TV time and everything, you know, uh, that you continue to have good success along with the company. Thank you very much. I, I do appreciate that. I want to run through a couple of email things. we got a couple of calls as well as to get to, so we're going to rush through this. Uh, this, it was said on WCW.com's live, WCW live show, I guess just a few minutes ago, that Hulk Hogan not only has creative control over his contract, which we all know, but the contract provides for him to be the main event of six pay-per-views for each of the next two years. Now, 
I that, that may very well be right. I remember just like a couple of days ago, I asked someone about in WCW what the contract was, and they told me it was, it was, it was two years. It had two more years to go, but it was six pay per views over the two years, as opposed to six each year, uh, as far as the guaranteed aspect. But this may be right. I'm not saying that that what I just told you was right. I'm just saying that uh, I asked that, and that's what I was told. Um, this is from Dave Stubbs, who is actually the sports editor of the Montreal Gazette, and he just goes. I'd be interested to know what you thought, and to just Joel, about the bump that New Jack and Vic Grimes took on the pay-per-view. What kind of fear did you feel at the moment, and how are both guys doing right now? Um, I was certainly afraid at the moment. Uh, I would I would think that uh, a lot of people were, uh, you know, e either afraid or, or worried or concerned, you know, different levels. But I mean, I'm I'm not a worker. By trade, I'm, I'm not a wrestler, a bumper, how, however you want to look at it. So I, you know, I can somewhat put myself in their shoes, but I mean, not really. You know, I, I don't know what it's like to be up there. Uh, I, I don't know what it's like to fall. I know what it's like to be on a table and have New Jack come down on me, but I, I don't know what it's like to actually do the dive. And uh, I'm sure it's excruciating, and, and I tip my hat to both of them. In, in the in the sense that they were trying to do and and, and did um, what they could do while they were out there to to gain interest and 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 to keep the fans you know as into the show as possible they they did in their minds you know what what they needed to do and and you know you can argue all day whether or not the bar should be raised in professional wrestling or in ECW uh you know you can say it, it makes the rest of the show tough to follow you know it, may, it does i mean the thing is just like with everything in wrestling you can argue left and right and you're going to have to meet in the middle because it, it could all be true and and everything about that bump was exactly what it's being reported to be, and, and everything about that bump was oh so wrong and oh so right. You know, and, and, and I give them credit for, I mean, you have to give them credit for taking the risk. Is it a risk they should have taken? That's, that's not for me to decide. You know, it's, it's for them to decide, or if they're going to do it on an ECW show, then it's for the boss to decide. It's not for me to decide, but as far as whether I was worried or not, uh, you know, you, you cringe when you see it happen. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. It's happened. You hope that everything is going to be all right. Um, I live close enough to Danbury, Connecticut. Uh, it was a local show for me. It was a drive. And on my way home, I, uh, I stopped into the hospital and visited New Jack. Uh, he, he seemed, you know, he, he had a concussion, no doubt about it, um, as you would expect. But, uh, what I found unbelievable is that uh, he flew home the next night. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, w was it too risky? Not really for me to decide. You can't. I don't think. I, I, I think. I mean, I just look at the courage of it all, and, and I say, you know, he he did what he could do while he was out there to to up the ante and and to to just keep it exciting, and, and he certainly went above and beyond the call of duty. Both of them did, New Jack and Grimes, um, in all the good ways and all the bad ways, whether it was good, whether it was bad, he went above and beyond the call of duty. Both of them did, and, and, and that's, you know, that's all you can ask for, and that's representative of what ECW's been doing and, and, and what the workers in ECW do to get the crowd involved and get them into it, and, I mean, since the beginning of the company. And this is from Mike in Syracuse who goes, do you still talk to the Dudleys? And did, when the Dudleys went to WWF, did you have any interest or did they have any interest in you? Or how did any conversations go with the WWF at that point? Um, I still talk to the Dudleys on occasion. Um, uh, as far as interest, no, at the time that the Dudleys went to the WWF, I was already into a contract. So uh, I mean, it's it's it would have been a moot point. It uh, it's a hypothetical because I I signed, uh, I believe around May first of uh, of '99. I signed for a, a three year deal, and that was a good few months before the Dudleys went. So I I knew on May first when I signed that ECW was where I was going to be for the next three years, and and I was very excited about it. So uh, I mean. Me going to the WWF was never an issue.
Uh, what this also? What are your thoughts of how everything went down with Sabu? Uh, the, the Sabu thing is a tricky thing, and I, I don't know that I'm the right person to ask. I mean, I, I know you know just as much, I guess, as the next guy. Uh, as far as my take on it, you know, it, it's. I mean, I, I guess it's it's his word against uh, against ECWs or Pauls or how, however it's being viewed. I don't know. I mean, it, it's just like anything else in wrestling, and it's just like anything else in business. It's you know, everybody's got a different deal. Everybody's got their contract, and and you know, I've never read Sabu's contract. Uh, I'm not interested in reading Sabu's contract. I don't know what it says. Uh, if he is in breach of contract by refusing to work then, you know, to the letter of the law. If he's in breach of contract, then I guess it's all on him. Uh, I, You know, I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I, I don't know. Let's go. We've got, uh, let's get get to some of these calls. We've got Ricardo in New York. You're up with Joel. Yes, hi, Joel. Hi, uh, Dave. Hey. Uh, is it, um, well, I have a, a, a quick comment and, and a question for Joel. Uh, now that Bishop is uh, back in EZW, um I guess he's uh, he, he has a second chance now to show us that he's at the same level as McMahon, which I think he's not, and he will never be. But he always tried to put himself in the level of, of this Vince McMahon, and, and I guess now he, he's going to show us if he really has what what it takes and he has really learned anything about the business. Uh, I, I don't know what what you what are your thoughts about it about Bishop coming back. He and, he and Vince Russo both have their chance, you know, to, um, I guess, to, um, you know, prove that they were unjustly dumped. I guess. Yeah. They have the chance. Yeah. Well, uh, I hope he uh, does well because uh, I know that the business uh, gets better when when there's competition and when both federations are doing are doing pretty well. My question, to Joe. Yes. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. My question to Joel is. Uh, well, could you clarify or explain to us what happened uh, to some of us that don't know really what happened to uh, uh, Mr. Gordon? That's his name. He, the, the, the Todd, Todd Gordon. Yeah, and is it true that WCW pretty much used him to uh, lure some main eventers from w ECW to WCW? And if this is true, can we really blame the ECW for going after WCW? And, and, and could you tell me if that's true or not? Uh, yeah, as far as Todd Gordon goes, at, around the time that uh, that he uh, started not to be around ECW anymore, I, I wasn't really an inside player in all that. I I don't, you know, keep in touch with Todd Gordon, or or I never really, you know, spoke to him except when I was at work. So I'm I'm not too familiar with the whole situation. My I'd like to say that what I think happened is he was bought out. And I know that uh, that there was speculation or talk that uh, um, he was trying to go to WCW or, or, or take people uh, to WCW. I, I don't really know the whole situation. I, I just know that his interest in the company um, was was sold back to the company. Hmm. Well, what do you know about it, um, Dave? I, I you know was, I remember hearing so much about it when it happened. And a lot of it was contradictory, but it's basically, um, I think that they had some sort of a deal with, with Paul and him. I, I don't know exactly what it was, but Todd had lost a lot of money early on the company. And they had made some deal where Paul actually, I think he paid Todd back um, mm. some of it, and maybe all of it. Um, so he kind of got back his investment, or maybe some of his investment. And they had a falling out, and there was something to do with the. You know, must, there must have been some contact with WCW and, and Terry Taylor and, and Todd Gordon, and it ended up with a split with uh, Todd being out of the company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember always hearing that we would hear the whole story at some point, and then sort of like it was one of those wrestling stories where, you know, you got that much of it and more details. I just I don't remember other than the basis of what you said was was how I remember it. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Joel, yeah, uh, I really like your Spanish uh, remarks. Sometimes you <laughs> I really, that's hilarious. I think it's you're it great, is. and you're thank you very much. I appreciate you're, it. You're much better than uh, the Mark Madden in my book. Uh, 
Keep up the good work. Thank you. I'm a fan of Mark Madden, and 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 I think he is. I think that's a, a little bit of a mutual admiration society. Yeah. I, I, I think he does his own good stuff. But thank you very much for the kind words. Muchas right. gracias, mi amigo. All right. Thank you. Okay, yep. okay Ricardo. Uh, let's go to let's go to Dominic in Virginia. Dominic, how are you doing today? Joel, doing very good. Um, Joel, first question: If you had to choose your own Dante's Inferno, which would it be? Uh, to watch a lifetime of Hulk Hogan matches from '95 on. Or uh, two naked lap dances for the rest of your life from May Young and the Blue Meanie. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I don't know. Uh, wow, that that's that's tough. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't throw Roller Jam or at least Rock and Bowl in there somewhere. Rock and Bowl. I watched that the other night. For Did you? Oh minutes. God, that was horrible. I saw it for five oh. minutes. Oh, oh. It, it only I only I only lasted about five minutes on Rock and Bowl too. Yeah, and that was just the intro. Um, what I talked about them, I talked to David about this a couple months ago. Um, when they were really starting to push Doring and Roadkill, and they were also trying to push kind of the U and Cyrus feud. Well, think of, I mean, I don't know how if this ever happened, but have you kind of be kind of managing Doring and Roadkill up to towards the pay per view and kind of, to me, I thought it would be the perfect, you know, you guys would compliment each other very good, especially you and Doring with so many sexual innuendos and basically talk about teaming some chicks over and over again would sound good and turning roadkill into basically a complete compliment of you, neck brace, you know, shirt the whole nine, but still the only thing you could say is chickens. And probably pussy, but I'm pretty sure chickens are the only word to say. <laughs> what would be your thought on that? I think uh, I never heard anything official about this, but I remember hearing, really, I think I was just reading it on the Internet maybe, uh, some preliminary reports, uh, you know, for whatever that word is worth on a lot of these Internet websites, not yours, Dave, but there's a lot of stuff out there where things that are reported as news um, aren't. But yeah. I, I like to read rumors and, and false news and everything that's out there just to keep my finger on the pulse of the wrestling public. And I remember seeing some preliminary reports that uh, that I was going to be managing Danny Dorian Roadkill, but I, it, you know, that didn't materialize, and that's nothing that I ever heard officially. Uh, from within the company, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure that would have, you know, I, I would have given that my all, and and put all of my best efforts forward, and and developed my character um, in such a way that had, you know, had it gone in that direction, um, I'm sure it would have been immensely entertaining. Uh, I, I love Doring and Roadkill stuff. I think they're developing phenomenally. Uh, Roadkill is the one guy um, on the active roster. I think that's as young as me. Or younger than me, he, he's really young, but he's he's very. Both of them, Danny and Roadkill, are, are very smart to the business and and just great athletes in, in their respective ways. And they're two of the guys that are going to be the future of ECW and the future of the wrestling business. So I would have loved to have been paired up with them. Oh, definitely. Because I remember I think I talked to Stephen Prezak about it, and he loved the idea. Um, not much more to say. Get some more calls in, and uh, I will see you in Richmond on the 31st. Thank you very much. All right. Enjoy the rest of your night. Yep. Okay, thanks, Dominic. Let's go to Wendell. Uh, we're running out of time, so you're the last caller. Hey, Dave, I got a question for you. I, um, now, wasn't Hogan signed on um, the um, It wasn't the wrestling company. Wasn't he signed on some other part of um, Turner? Initially, he was. I think that they may have. I mean, I'm not sure of how it worked after that. The initial contract, for sure, had the bulk of the money like uh, signed somewhere else so the company's bottom line wouldn't look so bad. But I think maybe when the company made so much money that could have been, it's possible it could have been transferred, you know, where, where it was all coming out of the wrestling company. Because I know, like with, with Bret Hart's deal, I, I know that the original offer would have been, like some most of the money actually would not have been paid by the wrestling company, but when he actually signed, all of it was because the company's fortunes had, had increased so well. Right. Okay, because I was, I was trying to figure out if, if he was signed to, like, the... Um TNT movie, uh, whatever they uh, network. Well, if we, if, if we look, if we look at it, he's done what one? He's only done maybe one movie, right? Right. With, with them, I mean, he did the one. I, he did the one that they publicized a lot that I can remember. Um, so I don't know. Um, he's I don't know. He's got him hostage though. Hostage uh. situation, holding the company hostage. Can you imagine Joel six more pay per views? If this is really true, if he's got six pay per views. This year and next year, they're going to be under a point one for sure. Yeah, you know, Hogan, um, obviously, you know, what it is that he brings to the table and, and what he does, he does well. Because you can see that there are a lot of people, well, there aren't really a lot of people at the shows, period. 
but there are a lot of people who go to the shows still bring Hogan signs. And uh, that, that's that's got to be a testament to something, I guess. I, I think the interesting part of the whole thing is that, talking about Hogan and contracts, I believe he was, part of his deal is that, um, like, uh, when, a, when a pay-per-view does better than its counterpart pay-per-view from the previous year, he gets, he gets a percentage a of the gain in profit. And there's what much there. is going on now is that the buy <laughs> rates are slipping. Yeah. Right? I mean, and, and I don't know that that's Hogan's fault. It's the company's fault. But it's a good thing that he's not being asked to give money back <laughs> when, you know, when Halloween Havoc 2000 winds up doing a quarter of the business that Halloween Havoc 99 did. It's a good thing that it's not like Jeopardy, where, where you answer the $800 question wrong at the beginning of the game, you go to negative 800. You know, I guess, I guess, you know, that's, you know, Hogan positioned himself real well. But I guess the point of that whole thing is that Hogan, is is a pay per view draw, or at least that's he's he was. a very expensive commodity for WCW, but he's there to be a pay per view draw. And he has in the past and throughout his career and and throughout the history of wrestling on pay per view, from the very beginning, up until now, up until recently, he has been a big pay per view draw. And and now you know, maybe he still is. Maybe for the amount of people that are buying the pay-per-views, maybe a lot of them are buying it for him. Who knows? But the point is the proof is not in the pudding anymore, and, and the buy rates are slipping. What that's attributable to, like I say, I mean, WCW has a lot of people there, a lot of great talent, but uh, you know, they're, they're just not doing it. Joe, we gotta we gotta run. Don't forget tomorrow we're gonna have Les Thatcher here. Monday we're gonna have Bret Hart, and uh, we'll be back 6 p.m. tomorrow. And thanks, Joe, for doing the show.